Hello, everyone. This is Danielle Parker with the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia. Thank you for joining us today for our latest webinar called Researching Historic Properties. We are joined today by Mackenzie Hitch, who is the Preserve West Virginia AmeriCorps member serving with the Jefferson County. Mackenzie graduated with her archaeology from the University of Athens, Greece, and has a BA in both history and classical archaeology from UNC Chapel Hill. Her graduate research focused on ancient Greek trade and community building through the Mediterranean. Upon graduation, Mackenzie took her skills in archaeology and historical research and transi transitioned them to the Jefferson County Historic Landmarks Commission, working to document, research, and preserve historic properties in the area. This has included producing original research on properties like Duffield's Depot and submitting to the National Register of Historic Places. Now, before I hand it over to Mackenzie, just wanted to let everyone know that if you have any questions throughout this webinar, there is an option where you can ask questions, typing them out. You can also raise your hand and we can give you the option of asking the questions yourself over the audio. Um, and so feel free to ask those and we'll, we'll answer those throughout the presentation. So I will hand it over to Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Danielle. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, how to go through re researching historic properties when they're under research and there's not a lot of information available about them right off the bat. Um, so thanks for joining. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I can change this slide. Ooh. Danielle, do you have the controls for? Letting you change, it should let you change it over. Because um, you have the. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so sure. where we're going to start. A little daunting from the outset, especially if it's your first independent and original research project, um, and you're responsible for the questions, the product, the interpretations, that can certainly be overwhelming. Um, for your property, where, whatever kind of property it is, if it's a farmhouse, if it's a barn, if it's just a battlefield, um, you might have a name or a location of the property and that's it, which certainly isn't a lot to go off. Um, and one of my main projects at the Landmarks Commission is to research and pull together materials for Duffield Depot, like Danielle said. Um, throughout the years, it's been nominated for uh, the National Register of Historic Places. So we have that research already, but not a lot of specifics known about the use of the structure, um, the daily activities of it. And that's what I've been tackling this year. And so we're gonna use that as a case study to go through. What you see on the screen are the benchmarks I like to set for myself when starting any research project um, on a new property. So we're gonna first talk about how you determine property lines, then how you create a deed chain, um, which is a super important step, uh, and then on-site research and documentation. You get into the nitty gritty organizing, interpreting, and writing uh, your actual research into a, a final outcome. So. For determining property lines, it's pretty easy, but you have to know where to go. For Jefferson County, um, we have an online interactive tax map uh, through the county assessor's office. Um, and so even if you don't know the current owners, when your property was built, or even the significance of it yet, which is very likely, especially in a bunch of these under-researched properties in West Virginia, uh, you can go to the assessor's office website and you can just find it by location. Um, so using Duffield as an example, we're gonna go ahead, I'll show you guys how you do that. So this is our interactive tax map for Jefferson County. Uh, your county probably has one. If not, just contact the assessor's office and they'd certainly be able to point you in the right direction. So this is what pulls up. And we're going to pretend like I don't know the name of the property, the current name of the property. I don't know the address, uh, nothing like that. And so we're going to try and find it on the map. And so I know it's up on Flowing Spring Roads. I drag the map. Um, 
And here I see the unincorporated death field, zoom in. And from visiting the property, I know that there's one building in front of it, and then you have the depot. And this right here is the property. So you click on it, and over on the side should come up who currently owns it, the address of the current owner where you can contact them, and any further information on Duffields, I'm not sure why, but it doesn't have the year built or any of the materials. But if you have like a house, it'll likely have something that looks like this. So they have an estimated year built, um, exterior wall materials, and just specs of the building. So that gives you a really good ground plan for how you should go forward and what the building looks like today. Um, so you'll want to make note of that, uh, how you're um, documenting it. So after that's step one, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You're going to go to a deed chain. Now this is going to take a little bit more time other than just clicking on a website and pulling the information, but it's a super important step and you, you don't want to skim over it. Um, so for a deed chain, you can set it up kind of however you want, but there are some uh, sections of information that you want to be sure you have, like the date, uh, the grantee, which is going to be the new owner of the property, the grantor who sold it, deed book, page number, and then acreage and property value if they're listed, sometimes they're not, and then notes and a link to the deed itself, which I download in a PDF form. Um, I find this the most useful step for getting a handle on the property, its people, and its history. Um, and so how you do this, there's a couple different ways. For Jefferson County, we have um, the deed chain or the deed books are digitized and they're user searchable and you don't have to actually go into the county clerk's office, which is where no matter what county you're in, that should be where all the deeds are housed and they would have hard copies of them. So if your county does have an online database, it's really easy to get started on it. You'll go back to where you clicked on your property on the assessor's map. And right here on the left, it says deed book and page, and this is hyperlinked, which makes it super easy. So you don't have to search your county's website to figure out where they're housing all of this information. So when you click on that, it immediately opens up a deed. And you're gonna look through it. It's gonna say things like, party by uh, party in the first part uh grants party in the second part all that kind of legal jargon that you don't need to get into what you're looking for is the definition of the property which will have something bounds description and this is where you want to look to know exactly what property is being deeded uh, you don't have to write it verbatim in your own deed chain but you'll wanna know what it says. And it helps you understand where the property is located. The next thing you want, and this is really gonna get your deed chain um, started, you're gonna look for the same real estate conveyed to so-and-so. Um, and this is gonna be the deed for the property uh, immediately preceding the current one. So that gets your chain going back and you can follow it. So here we see in deed book 1032, page 48, we have the date of it and the, the previous owners. So you already have um, a bunch of the information for the next entry on your deed chain going. And you're just gonna follow that continuously until you can't go back any further. Now, when you get into properties that date back before the 1900s, a lot of times the deed book will be really hard to read and you might see something like this in handwriting. And personally, I have no idea what this says on the computer, uh, really difficult to interpret. So that's when I like to go to the actual uh, clerk's office and look at them in person. Um, don't be afraid if you really can't read it to ask for a second set of eyes to understand. Um, but the really great thing about the older ones, as opposed to 20th century deeds, are they give you a lot more information on uh, like neighbors, families, they'll mention will books more. Um, they were just a little more in depth with like goings on with the family and the property. 
Um, when you do come across one like this, I suggest transcribing it as best as you can and taking a photocopy of it and linking it to your D chain. So that way, when you need to go back and reference it, you don't have to go through the same process of slugging through all of these uh, hard scripts. Um, Okay, so that completes your deed chain. You wanna put in as much information as you can that you think is relevant, but you, you certainly don't have to go overboard. It's really just to get a handle on who the owners were, what the property lines were throughout uh, its existence and how far back the building dates. Um, and a lot of times you'll have the, the property value listed. So that gives you an idea of what kind of buildings are on the site if you don't know. Um, what kind of activity took place, if it was farming and they produce a lot of agriculture products, then the, the site value would definitely go up. Um, so step three might be my favorite step, uh, on-site research and documentation. Um, so after you have your detail and an understanding of the landscape itself, at, at least on paper, your next step is to do some on-site research. Even if you've been to the property before, Going with the clear intention to collect data calls for another visit for sure. Uh, at this point, you'll wanna start developing a clear idea of what you need to research, but since you haven't done much bibliographic research at this point, it's okay to have a, a general, general direction. When I started on Duffields, we had a very broad charge of uh, find out everything we possibly can for every possible time um, and, and go forth. Uh, this meant my site visits were about documenting and noting just about everything. Um, I've been out to the depot a few times and have taken probably close to 100 pictures of all the different features, even if I think they might be a little um, like I'm overtaking pictures, uh, but they're, they're still going to be useful. Um, you want to take pictures of the property from every angle of specific features like doors and windows. Uh, foundations, if you can see them, um, floors, and, and anything else. Um, if the building property dimensions haven't been documented yet, they, they probably have, but in case they haven't or they haven't been done recently, you'll want to take those as well. Um, it might seem excessive, but it's much better to have an abundance of pictures and measurements that you might not need in the long run than get halfway through your report or your final product and realize, oh man, I'm missing a chunk of information. I don't know what this room looks like. I don't know how this side of the house functioned. Uh, so better to be safe uh, than sorry. Um, so on this slide, the first picture on the left is just the overall picture of the depot. You get a sense of the landscape. You can see the railroad behind it. Um, it's a nice picture, I think, to, to understand the depot. And then inside, um, you can see a lot of the damage of the depot, but you also can see the mantles that are original, the floors. Um, the third picture is the basement that has been flooded, and it just gives you an idea of how um, how old the structure is and how much the natural elements are playing a part in uh, its current condition, which might not seem super important when talking about the history, but when you want to know how the structure and property has changed over time, these are really great images to have side by side with older images or older renderings that you come across. Um, and it's just a fun, a fun step to do. Um, so after you have all this and you feel like you have a good grounding in the property and structure features as it stands today, still not going back into um, like the original look of the building, the original use, nothing like that yet, how you see it today and what you um, can for sure say. Um, it's a good time to write up a summary of the property. This is simply so you can have in one place any of the information you've gathered so far and it's not scattered in different areas. And since this is for your own use, there's no set way on how to do it, but I prefer a summary paragraph at the top. Um, and then bullet points down the document. Things like current tenants, if there are any, um, the construction date, if you know it in Duffield Depot, we know it was 1839, and we got that information from the original deed of the property, um, materials that are used to build it, and the current use. Um, and again, this is just for your own use. This is just for you to know what's going on on the property today. Um, okay. 
four, and this is where you really get into the meat of the property and researching, um, where you organize and interpret. Uh, so now that you have the foundation, um, like you would with a research paper or anything like that, you want to outline your research before you just dive in. So at this point, you should know enough that you can narrow down your narrative and areas of interest. For Duffields, we knew that it was a private depot for the b &O Railroad built by Richard Duffield, that a Civil War raid took place at and near it, and that there was a station master named John Hillary. Um, this is kind of all we knew. Um, again, we didn't know the specific use of the building and that's what we're trying to figure out the day to day. Did anyone live there? Um, was there a ticket office? Uh, what was stored at the depot? Um, so we broke down the research into the land use and change of the property from 1839 to the present the use of the depot itself and biographies of people associated with the depot. So we have three different arms of the, the research that we're going for. Together, this would give us a comprehensive view of not just the physical structure, but the people history of the site, which, you know, the trend in historic research nowadays, you really wanna know um, like the emotional side of the building and the property and, the stories that took place there, not just, this is a brick structure built in 1839, it was a depot, done. Um, so when pulling together your outline, including your guiding questions, um, so you can keep your research focused without going out on far tangents, is really useful. You can treat it like a brainstorm even. What would you wanna know about the property that hasn't been compiled into one piece and one place? Um, so on the screen is kind of what my original outline for Duffields looked like for the use of structure section. Um, and some of these I already knew from the deed chain, but it's important to have them listed anyway, so you, you don't forget to put them in later on, uh, just human error. Um, so why was the depot constructed and who funded it? And do we know the architect? Um, is there any comparanda in style locally or regionally? Um, was it purely a depot or did it also serve as a residence, which is a big question that we're still looking into. Um, what was each room of the depot used for? Are there any inventory lists for the storage section? Um, was it produce or crops, farm material, clothes, anything like that? And then finally, are there schedules for when trains dropped off goods and when farmers should bring their products to the depot? So all of these questions can take you in a lot of different ways to actually research them, but they're, when they come together in a narrative, they, they all make sense. At the bottom um, is just a quick, kind of like the summary paragraph that we have for uh, Duffield's Depot. Um, so it's a good starting point um, introduction that you can use at the top of your outline if you want and then answer the questions you have. It just really depends on your uh, your type of research that you like to do. Um, so here are some really great resources that I continually go back to over and over. Um, and these could be accessed after the webinar on the, the PowerPoint. Um, and I recommend if you're doing a lot of historic research to book because you're really gonna be continually going to them. Um, so while certain libraries or collections might be specific to your site for some information, uh, these avenues are digital ones where you can get a ton of information. The first place I start, and I usually have it ready from the beginning of the project, is any National Register nomination or other reports on the property that might exist. With Duffield's Depot, we're lucky um, that a national nomination already existed. Uh, so some legwork on a narrative and significant events was already done, but it was pretty general and we, we wanted to get specific. Um, all of the National Register nominations are accessible on the National Park Service website, and that's the link right there. You can search owner name, you can search years, regions, um, and specific property names. And if you're stuck for where to start searching in books for these places uh, that you're researching, the nominations have a, they require a bibliography at the end. So at the least, you can, you can get a springboard there. Another resource is the West Virginia Historic Property Inventory Forms. Um, in Jefferson County, the Landmarks Commission website uh, has listed all the county landmarks and National Register landmarks with their nomination reports linked to them so anyone can access it. Um, your county might offer the same thing, um, but that, that's specific to the local landmark commissions. 
Um, of course, both the national nomination and the West Virginia Historic Property Inventory Forms are for better known properties. Um, but if your property is like Duffield, they only provide a cursory overview lacking the specifics that research today tends to like. Um, so don't get upset or frustrated if you don't have one of those available to you on your property. It's, it's not the end of the world. Um, so your next stop is your local library. In Jefferson County, we have a dedicated room to the history of Jefferson County. And Shepherd University has a great deal of research, which makes searches really convenient. If your county or town doesn't have a well-stocked library, do as much online reading as you can and know exactly what books or sources you're gonna need. Um, a lot of libraries uh, have a loan program or you might have to take a, a short day trip to a library university. But with uh, historic buildings, especially the 18th and 19th century ones, there's a lot of open source material out there that you can find. Um, I think JSTOR, uh, a bunch of those are, are free to access. And if you contact your historical society or a library, they might be able to give you access to the ones that are uh, paywall protected. Um, and that leads me into um, things you wanna look for in the library. Uh, some books to keep an eye out for are compilations of marriages, deaths, and land inventories published for the county. Um, they might be digital, they might be um, in print, it really just depends, but these are great for seeing, um, again, the peopled history of your site. So if you know the original owner and maybe the property was passed down um, by wills, you can see when the people died, how the family's intertwined, and you can get an idea of um, like the family history of the property, which is really important nowadays. Um, so your local historic society is another great resource. Many societies put out some form of a magazine. Your local library likely has uh, the back issues. They publish papers on topics relevant to the county. And there's a good chance that the structure you're researching has at least been mentioned in it. So you might have to go to the index. Um, or if you have a, an event that you're trying to research that pertains to the property, they likely have that uh, included in there. And West Virginia with so much history in um like mining and the civil war and the revolutionary war there there's tons of events that just touched every part of the state so i i really don't think you'll be at a loss there um old maps uh which your county's gis or planning department will have on file um can tell you a lot about a property in the 19th century cartographers would map out properties in an area sometimes even pinpointing where the structures were and who the owners were at the time if you can put together a chronological sequence of these maps focused on your property, you can create a really strong visual of the property changes over time, uh, when new buildings were added and if owners changed. Information you might not otherwise know because the deeds might not be specific, especially on when new buildings were added, when buildings were torn down, that kind of thing isn't gonna be recorded in the deeds. So maps that show these structures you know, in 1859, but don't show them in 1872, you know, they might have been torn down and that's something to note. Um, just a, a like slight organizational thing, and it sounds pretty reductive, but just be sure to take the notes under your topic questions to keep your information organized and make sure that you're staying on track, especially with some of these really great resources, it's easy to get sidetracked. And I, I personally find myself going down a rabbit hole of, oh, I see this building, there's a building in the background, I wanna see what that building is, and I'll look at a ton of pictures for that and realize, oh, I'm not doing anything with Duffield Depot. So just try and stay uh, vigilant with what you're, what you're actually looking for. Mm. Okay, for Duffield, the newspaper archives is where we found a lot of information that we hadn't come across anywhere else. Um, since we were interested in the day-to-day -day functions of the depot as a key stop on the B&O and a, it was then a rural village, local newspapers were key to understanding what went on. Uh, Chronicling America, which the link is on the previous slide, is the national database for newspapers and images, and they're in indexed so you can narrow down your search. It's helpful and it's free, which is great, but the indexing isn't the best and it doesn't successfully search uh, complete phrases all the time. This spring, we uh, at the commission started using uh, this website called Genealogy Bank, which is also listed in the previous slide. Um, 
And while it does require a subscription, I highly recommend considering it uh, for your own research as the best newspaper indexing indexing system that I've used so far and is really user friendly. And the newspaper clippings on the screen now, I pulled straight from Genealogy Bank. Um, when going to newspapers as a source of information, start with just broad search terms, like the name of your property, um, the original owner, the town, and see what comes up. From there, you can search for more specifics, um, like events and um, like later names that come into come into play. Um, for Duffield, one of my favorite articles I came across uh, was a letter to the editor by a local woman who gave readers a tour of Duffield's village. Since the village of Duffield's proper no longer exists with just a few abandoned structures remaining uh, and the use kind of lost to history, articles like this help us recreate the community around the depot like how it would have been. In her letter, the writer mentions a Duffield hotel, which is the only mention I've come across of it. It's not recorded anywhere else, so that was new. Um, it also mentioned uh, merchant business, uh, shoe shine, and what was, I think, a pretty funny tidbit. Uh, there was an early speakeasy, I guess, but way before Prohibition. Um, and she writes, a Mr. Pence uh, silently dealt the distilled damnation. <laughs> Um, so little tidbits like that are really fun to glean from the newspapers that you really couldn't find, uh, couldn't find in deeds, couldn't find probably in books just about the property. Um, uh, let's see. And through her other letters and through other clippings in the newspapers, um, we get a sense of the fact that Duffield Depot was a huge hub for merchant business and product storage. Uh, you can see from the two clippings on the left, uh, a J.S. Melvin, who was a later owner of the depot, um, would advertise what he was selling at the store. And so from that, we know that not only was it functioning as a train depot where you can buy your tickets, get on and off and travel, but they had a storeroom to the side that wasn't just for storing grain that would go on the train, but people could come and buy wares, buy products and sell it also. Um, and just out of sheer interest, uh, they're a great source for finding anecdotes, like the one on the right where a boy got his foot caught while boarding a train, uh, which details human interest pieces um, and doesn't really tell you much about the use of the structure, but you get an idea of kind of how the community was around it. Uh, another story that I came across was a 10-year-old boy who he just fell asleep next to the depot, like too close to the tracks and he was waiting for a friend and just nearly missed getting his legs run over by the train. The article talked about how the boy was startled and people in the depot ran out to check on him and then made sure he stayed on the depot's porch. Um, like this, they're not gonna tell you much about um, how the structure was built, um, who designed it, nothing like that, but it gives you a sense of um, like the human interaction with the structure, which is just as important as understanding like uh, the windows uh, are six over six or something like that. Um, with all of the newspaper clippings, it might get a little overwhelming, but I like to clip them uh, like a screen snip, something like that, and save them as PDFs or image files into a single folder, even if I never look at them again. Um, you never know what's gonna be useful to the next person. And it's really great to have them on hand, so in case you do wanna use one of them like these, it was really easy for me to just go into my folder of newspapers for deaf fields and click out which ones I wanted. And then you don't have to go through the whole search process again, which can be pretty overwhelming. Um, and then what I think most people get most engaged with um, is through photo archives. Uh, West Virginia University and the West Virginia State Archives, both the links are on the sources page. Um, They've compiled really incredible collections of people and places throughout the state. The Library of Congress also has a searchable nationwide database. Um, and what's great about those is that in the early 20th century, the Historic American Building Survey, um, and it produced a ton of pictures of properties that might not have anything written up about them. So for under-researched properties, it may be the only source of old pictures. And 
these pictures can be presented side by side by your current day pictures that you took on your site visit and documentation to really demonstrate the changes in the buildings. And these pictures that you see now, they're not Duffield's Depot, uh, but they're from the historic uh, American Building Survey. So you can see the photo quality is really great, um, black and white, of course, um, but you can see all the details and you can see how they've fallen down then. Um, and the uh, citation information for the pictures some of the time will give you the name of the property, uh, always the name of the property, but then sometimes it'll give you when the property was built, who lived there, a little information that you might want to know um, about the picture, but but not always. Um, okay, so after you've done all this research, you've filled out your outlines, you've answered all the questions you need, it's time for you to craft a site history and uh, biographies of the people that were uh, involved in the location. Um, okay, so you're gonna try and turn all this information into a narrative, combining the brick and mortar facts of the structure, the information about owners and its use, and any other information you might've come across that you didn't expect to at the beginning of the research. Um, the best way to do this without it turning into a super extraneous research report um, is through a, a timeline. So on the left, you can see one that was done for the Landmarks Commission a few years ago. And what you're going to want to do is start at the very beginning of the land, as far back as you can go. Um, if it was a land grant, if someone's family had held it, just really the earliest possible mention you can. Um, in eastern West Virginia, um, I know a lot of the land here was parceled out through the Fairfax land grants. Um, and so most of it we can trace back to the mid 18th century. Um, so you start at the construction of the building or the purchase of the property and work your way through to the end of your period of significance. For this, you really don't have to go up to 2020. If you're looking at the property, like we are at Duffield Depot from 1839 to 1884 when it stopped being used as a depot, that's really the only timeline you need to produce the narrative for. Um, once you finish this document, it serves as a great reference sheet for other researchers or as easy handouts to people that are visiting the sites if you're giving a presentation on it. Um, the example for Gap View on the left, you can see that uh, they mention different deeds, dates of purchase, quotes from wills, um, people's names. So when you read through it, you're not overwhelmed with this whole book about this site, but you get the gist of it and then you can move forward. Um, and in, so in addition to the site history, you might find it useful to draw together biographies of some of the people associated with the property. In the case of Duffield, we're focusing on five different people. Richard Duffield, the original owner, John Hillary, the station master, whose name we only know um, because a James Taylor sketch was produced in the late 19th century of the depot and it mentioned him as station master at the bottom. Um, James Hunter, who owned the depot sometime between 1854 and 1867. Jacob Melvin, the owner of the depot after Hunter, and Robert Weissong, who we talked about a little earlier, who was a huge merchant in the area and who owned the depot um, until it was retired. Um, so each of these people had a prominent role in the community and were heavily involved in the commercial business of the county. So creating biographies of these people, um, even aside from their daily interaction with the depot helps us to understand how the property functioned and what their role was with it. Um, for example, we recently found out through an article about post offices in Jefferson County published through the Historical Society magazine, um, so great nod to them, um, that Hillary, Melvin, and Hunter uh, were all postmasters at Duffield's, as well as Richard Duffield's son. This led us to look into the post office in the village of Duffield's and to see if the postmaster and the station master were the same person, because lists of station masters we've only come across once. Um, by writing the biographies of these people and understanding their life events, we can draw conclusions about motivations for buying the property or continuing to live on the property, um, how it was run and how the function of it changed throughout the years and over different owners. Um, if you're researching a house, this might be pretty straightforward. You might do the biography of just the original owner, or you can do a family biography. Um, but with a commercial building that changes hands 
over unrelated people, um, you're going to have a lot of different interests over time uh, being presented there and different periods of use. And that's really important and, and interesting to, to outline. Um, the biographies really don't have to be long, just a few paragraphs and links to relevant material like newspaper clippings again, um, and perhaps other deeds and properties they owned in the area. Uh, again, the goal is for as comprehensive of an understanding of the property as possible, even if the information isn't used in the final product immediately. You'll come back to it eventually, I promise. Um, okay, so your last step, you've done all that. Now you have your final product. So you'll know what your final product is gonna be at the beginning of your research, so you'll already know this, um, but now you'll have all the information to put out many different ones. So products like the West Virginia Historic Property Inventory Form, Historic Structures Report, brochures or interpretive materials, um, national nominations, landmark spotlights, newspaper journal articles, comprehensive report, uh, and even grants, all of this information and research can be used directly to produce those. Um, at the Landmarks Commission, we like to have a West Virginia property inventory form filled out for every property, even if, uh, even if we're not submitting it to the state. It just helps as a really good baseline for later on in case you are picking up um, that property to nominate or to research or even to post on social media about, you have all this information at your fingertips. Um, so on the right, you can see, this isn't for Duffields, but uh, we're still working on the Duffields Depot brochure, but this is for uh, the Peter Burr farm. You can see the information there is pretty general, but we have a timeline, uh, past drawings of the house, pictures, something. So when someone who's never visited the site before can pick it up and see, okay, this is the overview. This is, uh, the basic facts of what I need to know. And then they can ask you if you have more specific questions and you already have the research done. You don't have to field the question or be like, hmm, I'm not sure. Um, the main goal for a lot of this stuff, um, when it's not submitted to the state uh, preservation office or for internal use is really for, um, for uh, excuse me, um, is for public engagement. Uh, I've never been irritated that I had too much research at my disposal and it makes your job going forward and people after you's job just that much easier. Um, that's it. That's uh, the quick overview of how to do uh, historic property research. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mackenzie. That was excellent. Uh, very informative. So we will um, take some questions now. You can either raise your hand or you can submit them through a text in the questions box. Um, there was someone earlier who had raised their hand and I clicked the wrong button. wasn't able to see that person ahead of time if they want to send in again. Um, okay, here's one question that says, after documenting and collecting a lot of data, what is important to be noted during analysis or does it largely depend on your research topic? It's gonna really largely depend on your research topic. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to, to study a structure like the depot for its uh, interaction with railroad and railroad history in the county, if you're collecting a lot of information on what's being stored and you oh, and perhaps you get a list of inventory, you're gonna interpret that as, okay, this is what's being uh, transported throughout the county on the railroad. Uh, these types of materials are in demand somewhere. Um, and then you can connect it to broader themes like railroad history in the Eastern United States. Um, but if you're just collecting information just to know everything you possibly can, the analysis is going to come a little later when you have a purpose for that information. I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, any others? One person says, what is the so what for these types of projects? What can we take away and use in modern times? Um, I like to think that the so what of a bunch of these 
properties and historic structures is the people history of them. So what did they do there? What were the lives that they lived there? And how can we better understand that? Um, that's one really great thing I like about the newspaper articles and searching for your property in them, because you can see, oh, they hosted a dance here. Oh, they hosted a food drive here. Oh, like there was a wedding here, something like that. And it seems so in line with everything we do today. And it makes those properties um, and the, the history of those people seem less abstract and people can really glom onto it and get a better understanding of what happened just in your local county to get it to the place that it is now. Um, so yeah, I personally go for the people's experience there and you know human truths that come out uh, in living in that property or, or visiting it. Next question is when you do an on-site when you do on-site research and documentation, what if there are dangerous conditions? Well, certainly if there are dangerous conditions, you don't want to go out. Um, Duffield Depot is a really fragile structure, and so like we're not allowed to go upstairs and take pictures up there, or visit up there. Um, so you, your supervisor with you, the owner of the property with you. Um, if you're just going to take pictures of the outside, you're probably pretty safe. Um, but someone that knows the structure better than you physically, you want to have them with you so they can tell you, hey, don't step on the floor there. Um, hey, don't go in, up those stairs, something like that. Um, you want to be cautious of every historic building you go in. Um, you just really never know. Okay, a lot of great questions coming in. The next one. One is what has been your best resource for architect builder? Mm, so I haven't really come across stuff like that quite yet, especially for Duffield's Depot. Um, it looked like it was a family built structure. Um, for homes like in Jefferson County, we have a bunch of Washington homes. Those architects are usually listed um, in like family histories of passed down. Um, or you can come across old, old site plans or building plans, and they'll have the architect listed on them. Um, but those are a little more elusive to track down. Um, my suggestion for finding that out is uh, contacting an, uh, like someone in architecture in a university in your county, something like that, and see if they can help you narrow down the style of the building and who might have been active in that time. Um, and just really, you know, reaching out for help there because that's uh, that's kind of a blind spot for me personally. Okay, the next one is when you are researching something with a lot of information available rather than a little, is there a metric you use Sorry, Danielle, I think you cut out at the end. If you don't mind repeating. Oh, sorry, I don't mind again. Um, okay. It says, when you are researching something with a lot of information available rather than a little, is there a metric you use to know when to stop researching and just start writing? Um, that kind of goes by your own gut. If there's so much information about it that, from the outset, you know specifically what you want to research. So this little tiny avenue of the structure's history, then you know read comprehensively what you can. But once you've come across the information that you feel comfortable um, writing your your product for or contributing something new to the research, that's when you go ahead and start writing. And when you start writing, it, you know it's not. Um, it's not that you have to stop doing the research. When I write, I continue doing the research, but it's a little more focused at that point. Um, and it's like, oh, I need a, a good citation for this exact type of door, or, oh, I can't remember what this event was. Let me just double check and pull in information about that. Um, so I think when you have a ton of information, having your specific question from the outset and narrowing down all that information to one, to one section and going from there. Okay, next question. Any advice on dealing with shifting property lines between deeds? 
Yes, so that gets really tricky. And with Duffields, we've certainly encountered that quite a few times. Um, in fact, there's a little like postage stamp of property in front of the depot that used to be part of the depot property, but it was sold to someone a little while ago. Um, so I think that's when you want to really access those old maps. Um, and I think uh, someone in the in the chat very helpfully provided a link to the State Historic Preservation Office GIS map. Um, but if you can find, uh, like in Eastern West Virginia, we have Howell Brown maps and they show all these old property lines and buildings. So compile as much of those as you can, highlight where your property is on them. And if you're computer savvy enough, try and overlay those so you can see how the highlighted section either gets bigger, small, in different colors, something like that. Um, and in the deeds, it should say, from this pin to this pin, or from the west side of the river uh, to the junction in the road. And that just takes a lot of like interpretation skills and knowledge of the area. So even if you have to go to the area and figure out where that pin would have been or where this described property line would have been because in the 19th century, um, it, it was just little metal stakes a lot of times that marked the edge of the property. So a little investigative work there um, and makes you get a little creative. Um, but sometimes you might not know when the property line shifted. You might not know what it, what was sold off, what wasn't. Um, and that's that's kind of okay if it doesn't impact the overall story of the building and it's not a huge loss. Of course, still try and track it down, but um, I wouldn't harp on it too long if, you know, 100 square feet in the corner, you can't figure out when that got sold off or not. Sometimes it might have just been, oh, they moved a fence line and they had a, you know, a handshake agreement with the owners. Um, so I hope that helps. <laughs> I also uh, have seen that the West Virginia Regional History Center has Sanborn insurance maps at, at, that's housed at WVU. So mm -hmm. that might be another resource for people who are uh, looking at West Virginia properties. Definitely. The, the final question up right now is, can you recommend a good how-to text or two that would give an overview for people who want to learn more about how to document historic structures? Um, yes, so I can, there's one book by, um, I believe, uh, Bill Terrio, who is a historian in Jefferson County, and he has produced a book, I think in the early 2000s, I'm not sure on the exact date, called How and Where to Look It Up. Um, and so if you just Google that, I'm sure you can find where a copy is in your library or if there's online PDFs, um, and that has really great step instructions on how to do that. Um, and I'm pretty sure the the Park Service has a guide for uh, writing out historic properties, um, structure reports, things like that. They've really codified it and made it easy to easy to access. But I would recommend the Terrio book, How and Where to Look It Up. Um, I think first and foremost. Okay, that was the final question. So thank you so much, Mackenzie. I think that was really, really useful. This will be recorded and added on to our website and also added on to the channel. So if you want to revisit it and watch it again or share it with others, please feel free to. And I hope you all have a great day and stay safe and join us for future uh, webinars that will be coming up weekly through August. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.